फाय फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइफ नाउ Asis, you can start. Then I will. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to our uh, second episode on uh, controversies in uh, orthopedics. From arriving, moving from controversies to arriving at a consensus, where uh, we discuss a topic uh, which has got, which has generated a lot of controversies. However, uh, we as an orthopedic community are slowly moving towards understanding what uh, constitutes those controversies and moving towards a uh, getting an answer so that every one of us is uh, sort of on the same page. In today's episode, we would be discussing about proximal humeral fractures, and we have got with us Dr. Ajit Kumar, Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee, Chatterjee, and Dr. Soral to uh, be with us to thrash out this particular topic of concern. At the outset. Uh, I would like to thank I would like to thank every one of you uh, uh, of our delegates who are uh, are watching us currently, and uh, I would like to invite Dr. Shubhranshu Mohanty, uh, who is our my teacher and our esteemed colleague, and who is the brains behind this series of uh, going from controversies to a consensus in orthopedics. So, warm welcome to all of you, and I would hand over the proceedings and welcome my co sort of uh, organizer, Dr. Deepak Gautam from uh, Kharger, to uh, you know, welcome Dr. Mohanty and start today's uh, proceedings. Without any delay, I would like to invite Dr. Mohanty sir to give few words regarding our series. This is the second episode of the first season, and <laughs> without wasting any time, would like to love to see. Uh, listen and watch uh, to Dr. Ajit regarding this new concept or see re re concept. I would like to say going back to Nelly. Okay, sir, Dr. Mahanti. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ashish and Gautam. Uh, good evening, uh, dear friends. Uh, we have started this series of uh, controversy and consensus because there are so many things, uh, so many controversies in every aspect of orthopedics and uh, whether uh, we have reached a consensus or not. what we need to know that is the motto of this series of webinars and this is the second episode and today we have uh, three eminent uh, you know faculty here uh, we have invited uh, who will be throwing us light on proximal humerus fractures our uh, guest speaker is uh, professor dr uh, m ajit kumar from uh, tejashini hospital in the mangalore and uh, he needs no introduction i think all out uh, people are in india he, they know him and uh, he is at present also the vice president of uh, indian arthroplasty association and as you know he is the organizing uh, secretary for the ioa con uh, 2024 to be held at uh, bengaluru and uh, dr ajit kumar has occupied many coveted post in uh, karnataka orthopedic association and uh, mangalore also and he is very uh, ardent academician and uh, many of his uh, students are well placed in many parts of the india and uh, so he will be delivering the lecture followed by dr rajiv chatterji from uh, monipal hospital kolkata he is a dear friend and uh, he is a very experienced trauma surgeon as well as arthroplasty surgeon and uh, he will sweep you through the discussions after dr ajit kumar's lecture that uh, what we need to know thank you dr rajiv joining today and uh, dr aditya soryal uh, from jaipur will be joining shortly he is a upper limb practicing upper limb uh, surgeon at uh, jaipur from rajasthan so without wasting any time may i invite uh, dr ajit kumar to deliver the tail lecture over to you sir you have to unmute yourself sir thank you dr subranshu indeed a privilege to be a part of this uh, program um and uh, at the outset thank you for your kind uh, uh, words of introduction and uh, without wasting much time um dr fadnis dr gautam dr soryal and my dear good friend dr rajiv um the topic that i had chosen is management of uh, four part proximal humerus fractures as we all know um if you club all varieties of proximal humerus fractures i think uh, um there is more consensus towards conservative management 
but if you come to certain defined uh, fractures i think uh, there is a lot of controversy whether surgery is ideal or you should still continue with conservative manage management in this day and era so i just see my screen is not yeah okay so basically we all know that uh, upper, upper humerus fractures constitute about a third of all the fractures of the entire upper limb extremity and uh, in the elderly it's the second most common fracture after the hip fractures however like uh, we discussed earlier consensus on the optimal management is missing so i'll just put up this one case here this is a 65 year elderly lady we are generally talking about elderly patients here in this talk so in this particular fracture with a slightly valgus uh, impacted fracture and the tuberosity in good position um conservative management is very very ideal and as you can see it has healed in a very good position and that's the functional outcome of this particular patient forward flexion is full and also abduction and overhead elevation is nearly full now here's another scenario where the proximal humerus is in varus as you can see and close reduction will be very difficult to maintain this and uh, if you can continue with conservative management this is what the eye outcome would be and uh, although there will be a compromise in the shoulder function but because of the lack of surgical complications like uh, pain stiffness uh, cutting out of the implants and even infection this is deemed a good result or a good outcome and you can see here that most of the movement here is the scapulothoracic movement so whether it is actually a success or a compromised outcome one has to decide the patient would be the best judge for this really and here's another scenario another 65 year old lady uh, as you can see osteoporotic somewhat similar it's a four part fracture and conservative management this is the outcome so where are we uh, uh, in this scenario where do we stand and what should be the best way out that's the dilemma facing all the trauma and the shoulder uh, uh, surgeons so the goals of treatment would be to achieve pain free range of movement and to achieve a pre fall functional range of movement and we need to discuss because conservative is by and large the, uh, uh, the literature supports conservative management so we need to look at this in conservative management prolonged immobilization can cause stiffness whereas early mobilization can lead to non union so that's the dilemma that faces uh, our, our the practitioner what is the current understanding we don't know the ideal treatment we we do not know which particular fractures do well with conservative because uh, we are comparing uh, all varieties of fracture so also we do not know if you undertake surgery which are the ones that do poorly with surgery so we need to get some sort of understanding so as you can see here from the left to right all modalities of treatment whether it is conservative internal fixation with plate nail or hemiarthroplasty or in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty every every uh, procedure will do well in uh, in the right indication with the right surgeon it will do well so the surgeon is or the practitioner is in a dilemma as to what would be the best way so if you look at literature for help um, everybody says uh, his series does well that's the problem um, conservative does well as you can see 90% by and large of course conservative management does well but if you look at the three and four part and particularly the high energy fractures does it really do very well in that that's the question that we need to look into so the resh technique that was popularized in germany and practiced in uh, lester that also does well okay so whether it is young or old it does well if it is internal fixation with fillos it as well right now internal fixation with fillos is the gold standard but it has its own problems and multi lock nail that's uh, the newer generation nails not just multi lock there are two three other designs as well they also do equally well in uh, dedicated hands okay so this is what it said 
again hemiarthroplasty does well given the right indications but in all the internal fixations even nowadays if you talk about reverse shoulder arthroplasty the tuberosity uh, realignment and union is of critical importance and that's what uh, gives a good result and if you look at it, all modalities at the same time, literature says, does not work well. So locking compression plates or fillos, you know, has a high incidence of fractures, high complication rates, and it, uh, huge rates of revision surgery. Uh, although it is considered the gold standard for fixation, there are huge number of complications associated with it. In the earlier generation of nails, this is the second generation nails we are talking about there was a 42% complication rate. And this is by no less a person than Pascal Boileau's uh, uh, publication. Coming to conservative management, if you look at the American literature as well, I, I was surprised actually that they are still into uh, by and large conservative management here. And uh, you see, they have compared non-operative treatment. They have lesser complications as opposed to operative uh, surgery. Also, infection obviously will be higher with intervention. So that is not a surprise. And if you compare arthroplasty, shoulder arthroplasty with other operative treatment, arthroplasty has a higher incidence of complications, particularly infection in the acute setting. So that's another problem that uh, although nowadays four-part fractures with reverse shoulder is doing better than conservative management, However, one has to be uh, very uh, careful about the infection rates. This was a study of Medicare uh, uh, patients from the US. And there, I was surprised, this is a 2023 publication, and 84% is conservative management. Only thing is, there are all the varieties, uh, uh, two part, three part, four parts, all are mixed up in that uh, scenario. That's the whole problem. And... Uh, Coming to the much uh, touted and much uh, referred to a PROFOR trial, um, huge uh, uh, response or uh, uh, references to this, and it is most often quoted the study. And uh, it was the largest randomized study in uh, 32 centers across UK. And they said that there was no significant difference between surgical treatment as opposed to operative treatment at two years. And so, Everybody says conservative management is better. So is that really the case that we need to uh, really uh, look into? So if that was the case, then it should have changed practice worldwide. But has it really done that? Have we all gone back to managing these fractures conservatively? So this is what this paper has looked into. And... Uh, uh, what it said is that the non-shoulder specialists would tend to manage these patients conservatively after going through that literature, whereas shoulder surgeons would probably beg to differ. So, if you look deeper into this uh, proper trial, what you need to understand is that was a huge number they started off with, 22,000 odd, and but the data of only about 13,000 was studied. And if you go further, um, the fracture patterns that needed surgery were excluded from the study. So you can understand that it is only the conservatively managed uh, surgery. They, they were a group that needed surgery, uh, but that was excluded from this study. And finally, only 231 patients were followed up completely. So this study uh, has, has its uh, drawbacks, and that's why uh, probably it is not the uh, Bible for managing these for these uh, complex fractures of the proximal humerus. So, evidence from the literature, most literature is towards conservative management, and the results of surgical management are in no way superior to conservative. That's what it says. But if you think uh, case by case by case, or if you think logically, uh, I would. Uh, really be surprised if this uh, this type of uh, fracture uh, as opposed to uh, anatomically reduced and fixed fracture like this is it the same would it behave the same would the outcome be the same so that's the question that uh, we need to study and we need to uh, come to a consensus 
if you look at the literature, it is not that the conservatively managed patients are doing better uh, or doing good. It is just that the operated uh, patients have more complications due to virus collapse, screw penetration, hardware problems. That is the problem. Functionally, if, if performed well, these results uh, would be better than the ones managed conservatively for these complex fractures we are talking about. I'm not talking about the uh, two-part or even the three-part fractures, okay? So the literature is a mixed bag and we need to look at it. So whether it is a simple fracture, a two-part displaced fracture, a three-part fracture, or even a fra uh, four-part fracture dislocation. So you're actually, each of these will be behaving differently. And so we are not comparing like with like. So that's the crux of the whole uh, literature search that we have. However, nowadays there is an increasing trend worldwide towards surgery and that can be uh, the reasons could be the patient's uh, high demands because the elderly are also leading an active lifestyle. The fracture patterns are complex. What the PROFOR uh, study undertook was only domestic falls. They did not include these high velocity injuries that we often see in our practice. Also, Dedicated trauma surgeons and the shoulder surgeons, the skills are skill sets are definitely superior than an average uh, non-shoulder specialist, if I could uh, say that. And also the uh, implants are improving. This is one study from Portugal, where this is one uh, publication which said that there is a definite increased uh, uh, bias towards surgery. They have, if you can see here, the other probably conservative management is only in 30%. Rest of it is either close reduction and internal fixation or uh, open reduction and internal fixation. Quite a high percentage compared to what the American study said that. So if you look at only four part fractures, there are very few level one uh, publications. Okay, there are 128 results that we came across and there is uh, not much of uh, uh, clarity there, but by and large, what they have said is the reduction has to be better, the stability has to be good, and you can have other modalities of internal fixation, or you could even replace these fractures. So they are, for these complex fractures, the literature is definitely going moving towards inter uh, surgical intervention. So, Coming to a well-performed procedure, these are the recommendations from the literature. Neck shaft angle should be restored. 30, 135 degrees is the best. You could actually uh, compromise a little bit. The tuberosity head distance is another criteria. 8 millimeters, 8 to 10 millimeters is what is mentioned. Anything less than that would have abduction restriction, functional uh, reduction there. So you should avoid virus reduction and um, try and get a good stability at, in your primary construct itself. Avoid medial uh, or the lateral displacement of the shaft. That uh, will not do well in the long run, these uh, fracture reductions. If the shaft is displaced laterally, they do poorly. So medial continuity is most crucial. How do you achieve it? is most important. And like I said earlier, cuff repair is critical, absolutely critical for good functional outcome, whatever be the modality of internal fixation. So here's one, this was after a uh, nailing really of a uh, multi-lock nail, a good uh, on table, you have to make sure that it is uh, solid and abduction also does not cause any uh, loosening or uh, uh, of the sutures. So this is a publication from uh, Ganga Hospital. And what Dr. Didan Island and his group have said is that, just what I mentioned earlier, the neck shaft angle should be uh, at least 125 to 135 degrees, nothing less. Medial hinge should be reconstructed. The uh, tuberosity should be 8 to 10 millimeters below the tip. And the plate should be positioned below the tip of the greater tuberosity and the calcar screw that's most most critical in this uh, fixation calcar screw okay so i'll just rush through a few uh, cases in uh, i think we can have some discussion after that 
So with these sort of uh, augmentation procedures, you can have a 95% su uh, success rate. So you need, if you think that the uh, biomechanics are not going, I mean, are not going to do well, or you need to augment it, you need to uh, improve upon the medial hinge. So you need to prevent virus collapse, you need to prevent articular penetration with the screw. And that usually happens when there is a collapse in these articular uh, uh, osteoporotic bones. So ideally, plating is recommended only if the medial hinge is intact, medial uh, continuity is intact. Or if you can restore it either using uh, a bone graft, a tricortical wedge, or a fibular strut, or whatever. So the there are multiple uh, the new designs in the market of the uh, current generation, third generation nails. Multilock is one that is readily available in India. And uh, the insertion point is much more central. It does not impair the rotator cuff insertion. And so uh, it is in line with the uh, canal and the, the screws are, uh, uh, unlike the uh, cancellous screws, these are more, have more threads and have better purchase in the cortical, uh, the cancer, osteoporotic bones. You can have a screw in screw mechanism here, which will uh, give a better angle stable fixation. And that's the uh, th uh, screws that you can see in that uh, on the right extreme, which is almost like the phyllose construct that you have. And you have bushings there in the uh, uh, to pull, uh, prevent pull out there. So the straight nail avoids malice, uh, virus uh, malreduction. Uh, the calca screw avoids the co virus collapse. Screw in screw technique prevents cutout. So all these distinct advantages are there in this newer generation nails. So, and uh, I'll just run through a few case examples to show that it really does well in these. So in a, in a situation like this, in a, uh, segmental fracture with a complex proximal humerus fracture, one, one single solution, one implant solution there. So if it is performed well, it does, the outcome is good. That, that's at healing there. And that's the functional outcome. Here's another one. You see the tuberosities are totally off. The neck, uh, the proximal humerus is displaced. And so Similar sort of uh, procedure here. Fairly decent outcome at three months. Good outcome. Here's another 70-year-old with a totally uh, dislocated head here. The Western literature may prefer a reverse shoulder arthroplasty here. Uh, but you can see in a well-done proximal, I mean, multi-lock nail, you get a very good outcome in these fractures. Even a head split fracture like this in a young patient uh, you cannot think of replacing this. So you need to, uh, of course, counsel and then tell him that uh, even if it goes in for avascular necrosis, functionally, he will be fairly decent. That's him at a short interval of about four months doing well. Of course, there is some restriction, but it was a head split fracture. Forward for flexion is there. So there are other modalities that are in the market, but uh, I don't have any experience with this. Just unique uh, Evolutis has marketed that. There are cages, inter, uh, intermediary cages. There are, I think, uh, uh, Halifax nail has come with a reverse nail from uh, the intercondylar uh, eminence that you pass up to the neck, but that's only been in, uh, mentioned in two-part fractures. So reverse shoulder arthroplasty, if it doesn't, if it fails, most of us are not trained in this reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So it is a nightmare if it fails. So there is literature to say that it does very well in the elderly over 70 years. But uh, in, across the spectrum, if everybody has to do it, that's a, a, a recipe for disaster. So coming to the current guidelines, the indications, clear-cut indications for surgical intervention would be displaced articular fractures, tuberosity displacement, very high displacement, more than one, one centimeter or so, fracture dislocation. Actually, the literature says even five millimeter displacement, uh, the tuberosity does poorly. So 
there is uh, increasing tendency to operate if it is displaced five to eight millimeters and fracture dislocations of, of course have to be uh, operated. So just as a uh, lighter moment, this was a publication in BMJ, a nonsensus treatment of proximal humerus fractures. Um, interestingly, 10 upper extremity surgeons uh, from the US and Germany, and you know who the other people are, versus five macaques. Okay, so this was, I think, in jest, but it has been published in BMJ, and they gave 40 scenarios to the 10 surgeons. And at different two different intervals, they were supposed to look at it. And the same thing was done. A few x-rays were apparently shown to the macaques. And that was how it was done. This is published in BMJ. And uh, all experts almost always predicted the outcome incorrectly and tended to underestimate this. This is what has been said. Whereas apparently the macaques were a little more, uh, they had better consensus amongst themselves. So this is just a aside really, but that is to tell us that uh, there is a huge debate and huge uh, uh, confusion as to what would be the best way out. So even the editorial, of course, this is 2016 when uh, we don't have a meta-analysis of the newer generation nails. If we have large uh, study of the newer generation nails, maybe there may be a tendency more towards surgical intervention. That's my gut feeling. So the take home message is specific group of patients will indeed benefit from surgery, like I mentioned here. And we need more uh, studies that uh, are more focused on the, uh, it's, it should not be a single basket, but individual uh, group of uh, fractures, say four part, three part or fracture dislocations that need to be looked at in um, isolation. Only then we will come to some sort of an understanding and consensus about these complex fractures of the proximal humerus. So thank you for your attention. Brilliant lecture, Ajit, as, as usual. Very crystal clear. Thank you. Okay, so shall I get the set the ball rolling? The discussion. Please, yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, conservative management, but what is conservative management? Exactly. That's another thing. Um, uh, most of them give a, a shoulder immobilizer. Okay. In India, it's the use lab or the useless lab in many centers. And uh, many people have just said that it is just a broad arm sling. You know, but the thing is the pain how to control the pain in the first week or 10 days. That's the issue. If uh, that is the reason I think most of our colleagues give a, uh, like a U slab or some sort of a slab um, so that what do you do? What immobilizes do you do? the shoulder better. What do you do? We give a shoulder immobilizer. Okay. And, so And how long do you give that shoulder immobilizer? Yeah. So three weeks is what we tell them. And at three weeks, uh, we start pendulum exercises and then uh, gentle uh, abduction exercises after about 10 days and about a uh, month and a half or so, six weeks or so, we start overhead exercises. Okay. Can I just share a bit of what I do? Sorry. Yes, sure. Share a bit, bit of it. So basically what I do, uh, my talk would be, you know, this person who comes, uh, conservative management, of course, first going through the profile of the patient, I ask them to actively abduct and elevate after just a simple paracetamol. Just wait out of my chamber, have a paracetamol. And if they can actively abduct and elevate to 30 degrees, I feel the fracture is moving together. So if it moves together and if it falls in the criteria where not displaced, not articular, I've started doing this and I found very good results. It's given them this abduction brace, this little pillow, Keeping the arm in external rotation for two weeks. After mm -hmm. two weeks, I should shift them to a pollen cuff, the arm pouch. And I found much faster recovery with this patient because otherwise, you know, the subscap actually shortens very fast. So once you give them shoulder immobilizer, they go in like this. Okay. And so what happens with that is they tighten up their internal rotators. And that takes a lot of time and pain 
So I just put them in abduction base like that for two weeks and just give them a call and um, arm pouch and mobilize, of course, super mobilization. I somehow have had this started with me and Shomitra have started this for the last one year. You get a chap who basically makes a pillow, simple pillow like thing. You know what? Right. After you do it for a supraspinatus repair, rotator cuff repair. And uh, somehow found in conservative management slightly better results when I'm doing them. When I'm so, doing so, them. so instead of adduction, you give abduction. Abduction. That so that, that, that to, to prevent the adduction contracture. Yeah. Right. One number and two is the balance rotation, happens. It is neutral rotation because subscap uh, fibrosis is very fast. And two weeks, if you try to move them, they, they don't move at all. So you keep them in neutral rotation. It's easy to get the rotations right. That's what they complain about at the end. Uh, what I found out at three months, had fantastic elevations and abductions. But especially ladies, wearing the blouse at the back, yeah. it's always a pain for the six months. After doing this, I found that they can do the rotations much better. I don't know, maybe something we just picked up and we tried and uh, on a mass scale. It, just uh, sharing a bit of thought. Yeah, I think... Let, let, let's have uh, Dr. Aditya's yeah. uh, you know, opinion on this stuff. Welcome, Dr. Aditya Suryal from JFK. Good evening, sir. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And thank you, Dr. Ajit, for a very lucid presentation. Now, let me just begin by asking you a, a very controversial question. Now, you know, you, as you rightly said, most of us, guilty as charged, are not very well-trained in doing the reverse total shoulder. Also, the fact that Indian glenoids are much smaller than uh, yep. you know, what, what the Western population is. So let me try and present a case scenario. You've got a 67-year-old male with a four-part head split fracture, or uh, rather a female, I'm sorry, osteoporotic. Uh, would you still try and, uh, you know, uh, do the nail for such a patient? Would you, uh, you know, we're talking about more than 65. So you are you going to try the nail or are you going to, you know, counsel them for a reverse total shoulder? And what is your advice to younger generation? Many, many people are watching this uh, program right now, our residents are so you know the post residency. What would be your advice to approach such a patient? Okay, first, uh, I think I'll address the younger generation. I think the answer yeah. for, for them is train yourselves well. So, if you are familiar with fixation, you stick to that. If you're familiar with reverse shoulder, if you're trained in that, please go ahead and do that. I think uh, this is a very challenging scenario. Um, I even, I mean, uh, I've done far more uh, uh, sort of hips than shoulders in terms of replacements. So if I have to do a hip replacement in a comminuted intertrochantric fracture, you know, it always gives me the butterflies, the goosebumps. Okay, it's not an easy undertaking even for an experienced surgeon. So I would not take reverse shoulder lightly. I'm not a trained uh, guy. I, yes, I have uh, done a few in straightforward arthritic uh, shoulders, not in trauma situations. And uh, in a trauma situation with all that, uh, uh, the, uh, the bone loss, the osteoporosis, the, the anatomy that you have to restore, the tuberosities that you have to get right, I would be very, very uh, apprehensive. And if at all somebody insists on that, I would refer the patient to someone or I would get somebody over to do it for me. I would uh, even head split, I'm not sure in an elderly, if the cuff is intact, I would uh, more be comfortable doing a hemi replacement. If the cuff is intact, if the cuff is not intact, then I think we can think of some other solution there. I have right, done so a lot so of hemis, hemis for uh, elderly with badly comminuted fractures. But the cuff needs to be intact. Right. And I think that's a very important point because I think somewhere down the line during our discussion now, it's become either non-operative or uh, fixation or RSA. I think we do still have, even though the literature doesn't speak much about it now. But I think there is this subset of patients where we can still consider doing a hemi replacement rather than oh, you know going all out and trying to do an RSA there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sis, uh, you have any questions here? Yes, sir. So, I mean, uh, this talk, this particular uh, point was not highlighted in the talk, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, regarding something regarding classification and the anatomy um, or the geometry of the fracture fragments. You know, there was a time when a lot of importance was given to the Hurtle's criteria. Yeah. So, where are we on that currently? 
So now I think we have realized that the blood supply from the posterior part is also equally important. Um, Hurtles was only talking about the medial hinge and the medial spike and talking about the vascularity of the head. But I think uh, we have now realized that uh, the uh, blood supply to the head is equally important from the posterior part. And I think that's why now uh, the deltoid split approach also people are a little wary about uh, the uh, blood supply going from that area. So there are some uh, talks and issues that you may compromise the posterior blood supply. So hurtles, um, yes, if you have a 8mm or more spike there, that, that's a good uh, thing that the avascular necrosis may be less. But uh, I think more important is uh, the uh, osteoporosis is one thing. Second is the head split or head the comminution there that you have. Um, that's more important in terms of getting a fixation. Uh, by and large, by and large, whatever is nailable, we nail it. Okay. Um, even if it goes into avian, it's not like the hip that they are weight bearing. Yes, the shoulder function is compromised, but at a later date, if you want to do a reverse or if the patient wants to go elsewhere and get a reverse done, that's still feasible. That's still possible. The important thing is you get the tuberosities to heal well because even for a reverse, to get the rotations, the tuberosities are very, very crucial. You may get good abduction or forward flexion with reverse shoulder, but there is literature now saying that if the tuberosities are not in the right place, then the rotations will be restricted in a, even in a rot, uh, reverse shoulder. I think that's a very important point you brought out. Tuberosities in place and height. Both yeah. together. You have a high tuberosity, limb pinch, you have restricted abduction, elevation, the pain. And that is, I think, at the end, uh, I mean, at today's state, I think the most two important is the tuberosities, head positioning on the shaft. You do that. If it's by conservative, it's conservative. If it's by operative, it's operative. But this criteria has to be the tuberosities at the right place, head on the shaft at the right angle. That's essential. Just to add to your uh, posterior circumference, I think there are two lovely papers actually. One had looked at arteriography uh, after a fracture, 65% blood comes from there post trauma. Right. And they have done even studies on uh, you know, cadavers, is 80%. Right. More important, 2011, there's a paper, Bastiani, which says that ischemic heads initially, which they looked at initially, they didn't collapse. So they did arteriography, they looked, they looked ischemic. But in two years' time, it didn't collapse. And even if it collapses, it's like, but asymptomatic. And there's a squeeze yeah, penetrate. Yeah. So I think uh, as long as you don't go fiddling at the back, because previously we thought the AHC, the anterior humerus circumflex artery was important. There's the PHC, which is more important. That's where I think the deltoid split approach is, is there. It's a great approach, definitely. Yeah. But sometimes you might end up disrupting the artery at the back. So very important point you brought out. Velocities, blood vessels, and head. Angle. Are there any questions from the delegates, uh, you know, yeah. attendees? <clears throat> so there is a, a question from Dr. Rahul Singh, and uh, it's asked on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, he's asked four part fracture dislocation in a 60 year old female. Should we go for a fixation or a reverse shoulder? I would still go for a fixation. Um, what about Raji? Yeah, fix. See, uh, unless the head is split in more than two fragments, I would go ahead and fix it. Because even if I have AVN, if I've got screws in the right place, not short, AVN is a non weight bearing joint, they do well. You get your tuberosities right. Tuberosities are the drivers of your shoulder. You get your tuberosity in the right place, you live in it. But Aditya? I, I, yeah, I think I probably agree with that, you know, and the other thing is you can always go in and replace. Replacement is an option which you'll always have. Absolutely. So I think, Absolutely. you know, primary, uh, if you get the tuberosity is right, avian really doesn't matter in the shoulder. I mean, you've all seen patients of avian, they, they hardly come back. It's more of a radiological diagnosis rather than a clinical diagnosis with most patients any which way. I fix it. I have even, even young patients, 40-year-old patients with AV. I've done them just bad injury, major RTA. They have AV in 10 years. I've been following them for 10 years. 
no, they are comfortable. It's a panwala. One is a panwala. One is an auto mechanic. He does all yeah. the jobs. Even we see many sickle cell avians of the shoulder. They they hardly complain. Anyway. Very true. Very true. Uh, rather yeah. they come for the hips, but uh, not for the shoulder. So, and also you what we need to understand is talking about reverse shoulder sounds very fanciful, but functionally the demand that our patients uh, put on it, the reverse won't last. Uh, most of our patients are very, you know, the, the younger age groups are very demand, I mean, high demand patients. So even if it's a head split in a young patient, we always fix it. And how many have you seen these locations with reverses? I've seen I've three. Seen two. Of, I've seen two. Yeah. I have, I have one done by me. Two. One done by me. One one done by me. One by my colleague, and one was presented. So there are three reverse shoulders in Kolkata in one and a half years. That's bad enough. The number That's of reverses think, would be about. I think for the person who asked whether I would fix it or do a reverse shoulder, I think uh, in our training most of us go through trauma first and come up and then do our sub specialization. So until one reaches that level. Please don't think about reverse shoulder. If you have done a fellowship and you're very confident, absolutely no issues. And I think you're looking at a dead end if a reverse total fails. Absolutely. Very and good. Good. You don't know what that's to do. End. That's the end, isn't it? That's Versus right. the end. That's yeah. And then it is girdle stone. <laughs> Ashish, any, any other questions? No, I think, I think that was it. I was just trying to check. So that's the only question which has come from the audience. Okay. Yes. Now, now, so in uh, today's scenario, 2023, uh, 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 Rajiv, could you just uh, give your thoughts about fracture uh, Nakimura's one, two, three remarks? So I think uh, uh, Ajit was very categorically, very clear about it. So in 2023, you have three uh -huh. options, conservative, operative, operative, or the replace, or Now, Conservative is a group of patients, not all patients, a very small subset of patients who are low demand, possibly non-dominant, dominant hand. But more important, what I look at is, can the patient do an active abduction and elevation to at least 30, 40 degrees on day one or day two? If they can, that means the fracture is impacted. That is not going to displace and that will do well with conservative management. That would be about, in the elderly, about 20 to 30 percent of, of practice. The rest 70 percent to look at, which are displaced, dislocated. Most important thing is the tuberosities. So if you have not heard of anything else, just remember tuberosity, tuberosity, tuberosity. If tuberosity is displaced, if it is gone up, if it is gone out, if it is split out, you need to go in and do something about it. If the head has dropped out of a socket, you need to do something about it. If the head and Chapter is disengaged, you will do something about it. So it's clear. Operative in these group of patients. Now coming to the operation, what do you want to do? I think fixation still is the gold standard. And fixation, I'm more comfortable with the pillars. Ajit is more comfortable with our nailing. If something is a personal choice and if what are we comfortable with? And I think in certain cases, especially where, once with a hollow, where the nail possibly fills up the hollow, it might be a good idea. But then personally, I haven't done a lot of them, so I do not know. But for me, a philos is a go-to option in these tuberosity displaced, head displaced, dislocated, and disengaged fractures. Coming to replacements, those are mainly for me and all of us here, I think the message is, those are go-to options when things have failed or things have completely crushed out of the way. And those are very small subsets because as we all discussed now, even ischemic heads are not symptomatic. If you've got a tuberosity is right, height right, if you've got a union at decent position, even if AVN, that shoulder does quite well. I think I, I hope I've covered everything. Yes. Any other uh, additions to uh, yeah, this? Before, before, before I move on to Dr. Aditya's opinion, one, one question, what about hemiarthroplasty? We didn't uh, discuss much about hemiarthroplasty. Many people uh, would prefer. What is the role of hemiarthroplasty today? Needs uh, prosthesis, you know, many of the remote corners of India, people would uh, like to do a, you know, needs prosthesis. You ask me again the same, same thing. I mean, if I can fix something, why should I replace it? Because of fixed, of fixed, very limited, fixed per, 
very limited scope and uh, believe me none of my hemis have got levels of abduction and elevation more than my fixations they are limited in the function number one number two you're talking of people in the villages they would like to reasonably not heavy but they would like to carry a lota with a hemi sometimes i'm worried if they can carry a lota so these are things to be worried about and you're doing a much more invasive procedure you're putting a metal in if you have in god forbid a infection you're in trouble whereas in fixation you just wait for you to take up so small things you can do whereas that's why i think hemi is a very small role as i said again hemi rsas at the last not to be thought about the primary and yeah thank you oh, dr aditya yeah, yeah there's one question i mean uh, before uh, we take aditya sir what is the treatment plan in a neglected uh, four part fracture with or without dislocation which comes after four weeks i think i mean uh, we're discussing about controversy so yeah that that doesn't sound like a good scenario <laughs> uh, yeah four months if it's uh, i mean uh, it'll be a challenge to fix that as well so i would probably depending on the age of course i would probably think of a hemi there so is it four weeks or four months i'm sorry four, four weeks. weeks four weeks four weeks four weeks, four weeks. Four weeks four. i think uh, everybody would agree for fixes uh, again look at the size of the head yeah. the yeah. head is decent big size he's got a small hinge still got to fix it because as we said discussed i mean even a avian head is better than a, because late hemis don't do very well hemis you should do with the, i think it's a standard you are teaching that if you don't do a hemi first seven days is the best time after that even hemis don't do well so the tuberosity is melt away the because hemis depend on the tuberosities and the rotator cuff those melt away then you're in trouble and i think at four weeks probably you know, the fracture is not united even if you want to do a hemi you want to bring the tuberosity back so why why not put a phylos or a nail there yeah. so, absolutely so, don't yeah. put some bone graft in if, if there's a yeah. gap put a put a fibula down I do quite well. I, I have done neglected ones even at four months, but the head was large enough. Brought it on, made a hole in the head, put a fibula into the head, put the fibula down the sharp back bone graft, built a tuberosity around it. Patient had AVN after three two years, but the patient was asymptomatic. The, the fracture he did. Head went to the AVN. So I had an actual hemi. I had right. a human hemi. I mean, it was a hemi. <laughs> Sorry. And you also have one more option. You can refer it to your enemy. <laughs> that's a good one i think we are running uh, out of time uh, so before we close let's have final dr aditya's uh, take on the you no know, fractures of upper end humerus then we we'll close this yes. uh, so i think i think probably you know and that was very uh, loosely told by dr ajit you know we we've actually misinterpreted most of the literature about proximal humerus fracture and i think you all of us must have a low threshold for operating conservative management with you know even minimal tuberosity displacement of five millimeters can have a poor result for patients um so yes uh, my threshold for fixation would be less uh, but my threshold for replacement will be significantly higher we all know that hra is not going to do well with abduction uh, reverse total shoulder very frankly speaking with the kind of glenoids and the osteoporosis we have and the sheer lack of uh, ways to treat of uh, a failed rsa i think fixation would be a better option and my my uh, implant of choice is again phylos i'm not very comfortable doing the nailing i've not done nailing much for proximal humerus fractures uh, maybe i'll go to sir and learn um, from him but yes till that happens phylos and tuberosity 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 like um, sir said is what you're looking for at the end of the day thank you thank you dr aditya dr rajiv and uh, uh, dr ajit kumar for an excellent discussion on the proximal humerus fractures and uh, i think the old age uh, whatever the teaching is that a size of the head fragment decides about the method of treatment and uh, second point is that uh, how well you fix the tuberosity is uh, your that function of the patient depends on that how well you fix the tuberosity is below the level of the head i think these are the two important conclusions which are which are there of course as old teaching that uh, we must remember thank you for a great evening and uh, thanks for all your inputs and i now pass it on to dr ashish pandit to give the closing remarks thank you very much sir
Thank you very much. So we have had a very interesting session and this will of course be uh, available on the archives for everyone to refer back to. And I would really like to thank Dr. Ajit Kumar. It's a pleasure to uh, hear you on various thank forums you. and yet once again. And you continue to amaze us with the kind of x-rays that you show that have been fixed with the modalities that you are showing. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Aditya and Dr. Rajiv, sir. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. And thank you, uh, Deepak. And finally, Ortho TV. Uh, uh, Maharishi, thank you very much for being there. And uh, we'll hopefully see, we'll see you soon in a couple of weeks' time with another topic. And uh, that will again be a controversy in a different aspect of orthopedics. And uh, keep watching the space. Thank you very much for being there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcy. Can you just uh, stop live streaming? Then stop recording and stop live streaming. I'll just tell you, sir. So we can leave the meeting. Uh, Can have some offline discussion. They're not stopped it. I think he's gone for a tea break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, I don't have his number. Sir. Okay, we can leave the meeting then. Thank okay, you. Okay, see you there. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you sir. Good night. Thank Good night, Dr. Subhanshu. Thank you. Good night.